never used the pitch traffic control, so this should be better than what I could do. So. All right. Um, yes, so um, a little bit about me, uh, for those that don't know me. Uh, I, I do work for Comcast. I've been on the, uh, the CDN team uh, 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 focusing on ops uh, for about two and a half years. Been with Comcast for 14 or so years. Uh, over 20 years experience in, in the industry, um, almost entirely in an ops capacity of, of one sort or another. Um, so config management, deployment, uh, these are, you know, automation is, is something I've been focusing on a lot lately. I've uh, been working with Jonathan that day to, uh, to help automate all the things So what I want to talk about right now is, uh, you know, one a problem that we've we kind of run into uh, as as we're growing and we're refreshing hardware, we're deploying a lot of new hardware, uh, primarily caches. Uh, yeah, they they show up hundreds at a time, and, and we need to get them out the door and and, and built as quickly as possible, uh, and. Today, the or in the past, the the process for doing that wasn't terribly uh, scalable. Uh, so we we were using the the Gen ISO uh, capability that, that's uh, available in, in Traffic Ops and, and basically, you know, inputting the the server details into Traffic Ops, you know, you know the DB and. You know, cutting a specific ISO for this new host and getting it to that host, however that host supports it. You know, different hardware has has different requirements. Um, but it was very repetitive, very time consuming, uh, prone to error sometimes. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to look at ways to you know make that a little bit more efficient. Um, So, thought about this a little bit, and in, in the past we've used different tools for deployment of, of hardware and provisioning. You know, things like Cobbler to, uh, you know, to build out servers. Um, you know, in, in an IPv4 world, uh, you know, if you're doing things like pixie booting uh, and, and doing deployments that way, you know, you can use DHCP. Uh, the, you can use DHCP, and the the it works well if all your servers are sort of contained in central locations. So if you have big data centers filled with racks of gear, they have you know a gateway or maybe a couple gateways to deal with uh, DHCP. You know that that will work. Uh, you have to configure an IP relay on your gateway to, to allow DHCP to work. Uh, but it, you know, it's usable. People have been doing that for, for ages. Uh, our problem was the fact that our caches in the CDN are so dispersed. They're not in a central data center. They're, they're, they're pushed down close to the close to the end user, they're in head ends, they're, they're all over the place. Uh, that, you know, getting DHCP working reliably and consistently in that sort of environment is, is really difficult. Uh, you know, you have to engage network engineering teams and operation teams and, you know, the team in this part of the country may be different than the team in that part of the country and it's just, it, you know, it's a lot of hurting cats. Um, so I, I, you know, I thought about this a little bit and realized that IPv6 can, can solve some of our problems here automatically. Um, 
So I'm, I'm kind of curious, uh, uh, folks um, here, who's currently running IPv6 on their on their CDNs? Most, okay. It's a new experimental protocol. <laughs> <laughs> that was required. Yeah. So is 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 anyone here strictly IPv4 still? I, 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 yeah, I wasn't sure if if, uh, if anyone uh, was was uh, stuck in IPv land or not. If it's a you mean on the caches? Yeah. So the, the, what I want to talk about, though, there, there's a feature of IPv6, uh, uh, neighbor discovery and autocomp, that I don't know if anyone's relying on that today on, on their CDNs, but uh, it, it, it comes in handy. So autocomp, basically, it's, it's sort of analogous to DHCP, except it's completely stateless. So you don't have to manage a centralized server or database or you know, a table of IP leases. Uh, it's all built into the, the IP protocol and the clients just do it naturally. Uh, it, it's enabled. Uh, you so mean stateless in the protocol or is there, there's still state in the clients that are sharing this data, right? So no, when when a when a client when an IPv6 client auto configures, it's coming up, it's generating the address on its own, uh, and there's different ways to do that too. By default, CentOS uh, uses a mode where the dynamically generated address is based on the client MAC address, uh, but that's changeable. Uh, there there are. IPv6 privacy extensions that you can enable, which will randomize that. It's not really useful for our situation. The you know the the uh, the IPv6 privacy is more applicable to things like mobile devices, where you're you know you, you're you're roaming around or you're 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 staying on a on a network for for a while, but you don't want your IP tracked. The, those optional extensions will help sort of uh, obfuscate the, the client a bit by changing the address around. Um, but the default is based on MAC address, so it's stable. It will persist across reboots and, and things of that nature. Um, and it's uh, it's convenient. I mean, you know, IPv6 was built to to do this. If you're if you're running uh, IPv6 at home, uh, you know, a lot of your de devices are probably auto-configuring by default. Like you don't have to set up DHCP, you don't have to manually configure. The caveat to that is that the the smallest, uh, I don't know what you, what you want to call it, like delegatable block in IPv6 is a slash 64, uh, which for folks that are new to IPv6 or just have it, or you know, just are peripherally aware of it, it's sort of a mind-bending feature. You know, for, for a, a smallest delegation, you're giving out uh, 18.4 quintillion 
roughly 18.4 quintillion addresses, uh, give or take a few hundred trillion. Um, and that's the smallest block that, that you can delegate. Uh, and that's, that itself isn't exactly true because you can, you can put uh, a larger prefix, uh, like a slash 65 or whatever. Uh, uh, at Comcast, our cable modems, you have to know an interface gets a slash 128. So it's, it's, it's a single thing, but the, that's the way you know, the system's set up to work. Um, so you can you can assign uh, larger prefixes, which would be smaller subnets. Um, what you lose, though, if you if you go to a larger prefix than a slash sixty four, then auto count breaks. So you cannot even in like a slash if you take a slash sixty four and you put you break it up and put a slash sixty five on two router interfaces, the clients off of those routers. Uh, just they won't auto count. You can still use it. I've done it. You know, you can manually configure all your interfaces down the stream, and it'll work. You know, you might have routing issues. You, you know, you can you can make it work, but you lose the auto configuration magic that's that's built into IPv6. So, so slash sixty four largest prefix you can. Um, yeah, it, it took a while for me to, to wrap my head around that. It, it felt like we were throwing away just a huge amount of address space for nothing. Uh, but then you, you remember that there's still 60 bit, 64 bits of prefixes left to give out, uh, which is still uh, a whole lot. my lifetime, we don't run out of IPv6 addresses. Um, if we do, I don't know if it's a world I want to live in. <laughs> so it, it, won't it won't resemble this world. If we have all, if we have the all, all IPv6 uh, internet allocated, it's, I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> well, it's, it's more than the atoms in the earth, right? Yeah, it's, it's obscene. But you know, someone probably thought the same thing about 32 bits at one point. So, so, uh, so this this uh, this feature of IPv6 uh, is called Neighbor Discovery Protocol uh, (NDP). Um, it has to be configured on the router. It, you know, it's not on by default. Uh, or it probably isn't. Um, so your gateway gets in, you know, gets configured. At, at Comcast, all of our, or most of our top caches, and maybe some exceptions, they, they're, they're connected to routers with a, a slash 64 in the IPv6 uh, uh, realm. Uh, so each, each cache gets its own unique uh, slash 64 prefix. Uh, there are exceptions to that. Um, some hosts do end up sharing uh, a prefix, uh, but they're, they're generally unique. Um, and as you can see in, the, in this example, um, uh, PDU capture, this is, this is the, the router advertisement uh, that gets sent out from the gateway. Uh, in it, it, it provides the prefix for that, uh, for that network. And then once the client receives that, it, as I said, it basically takes its MAC address and uses it to, to generate a, a consistent suffix to add on to that prefix. And then it gives its fully qualified IPv6 address. Um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you don't want to go bigger than a, than a slash 64 for the prefix. Things just start breaking. Uh, the, the magic breaks. Uh, so the these router advertisements they, they generally are sent out at configured intervals uh, on, on the router. Uh, some number of 
seconds. Uh, they can also be sent in response to a solicitation from the client, or you know, a new client that boots up in, in autoconf mode and makes out a solicita solicitation, which the router may then uh, respond to. So IPv6 uh, also breaks with some other conventions that we're familiar with with IPv4. Uh, with v4, uh, it's typical that the first node, you know, dot one or sometimes dot two fifty four is like your gateway, uh, but it's other, but your gateway is always on the same subnet as your host. That that kind of goes out the window with. There's no need for your gateway to be on the same subnet as your as your local interface, um, and that's because of the link local addresses. So every every uh, connection, uh, you know, every every network uh, uh, link, each each side is going to have its own link local address, uh, and the two hosts can communicate that way. So you may find, you know, in an, in an autocomp situation, if you look at your routing table, you may see that your, you know, your, your public facing address is this one, the global address, but your gateway may actually be a link local address of the router. Um, you know, just something unusual to keep in mind if you're interested in the ways of IPv4. So at this point, you know the, the host is is up and running. It's it's got a uh, a dynamic address, and it's 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 public. It's routable. It can get to everything it needs to get to. Uh, and like I said, there's no stateful central configuration needed. The client just did it all on its own. Uh, you know, with the you know, with the auto, uh, uh, router advertisements. So how we use this at Comcast is we've, we've customized our, our ISOs and uh, what we, you know, previously we were, we were cutting a, a, uh, an individual or a unique ISO for every single box that got deployed. Uh, and that ISO was used just to install that box. We've switched to, you know, something that we're, we're calling a universal ISO. So it's, it's ex essentially the same exact ISO with a couple subtle modifications. So when the ISO boots, and you, and you may not all be using ISOs to do this, you know, there's various ways you can provision your host, but you know, the, the gist of it is you need to get the auto configuration network config onto the freshly installed box one way or another. Uh, if you're booting from an ISO, an install ISO, um, the ISO itself, whether it's a uh, a legacy BIOS boot or an EFI boot, you got to update the grub configuration, uh, and uh, with these these parameters, so IP equals, and then your interface, whatever it is, E2 in this example, and you just put on auto six, and uh, that tells grub to configure, you know, auto comp the, the the network of the de device when it comes up. Uh, optionally. You want to put a, a working IPv6 name server in there. If anything in your kickstart or your provisioning process relies on DNS, then yeah, you need a, a working IPv6 name server in there. Uh, if you do everything strictly by IP, which I hope not, um, uh, then you can probably skip that. But uh, you should have a name server in there. If you do everything by IP. Right, right. Uh, the next part of the of the install ISO is the the 
database configuration uh, for CentOS that gets installed onto the, you know, the host OS itself. Uh, so this typically is in the you know, uh, Etsy system config network scripts, um, if config dash e zero or whatever. Uh, you know, this, this is basically what, you know, after CentOS gets installed, after you've got a whole OS and before you do your first boot, this is the, the, the interface configuration that gets put in. It's very, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. You're just saying use IPv6 and uh, flipping on some auto comp flags. And again, you, you want to make sure that a main server is, is specified in there. Uh, and that's pretty much all you need. So OS tuning, uh, by default, uh, with CentOS 7, autoconf is enabled. Um, I noticed a while back that, uh, that we weren't managing this with our, with our config management, so we were, in fact, enabling autoconf um, just by default. And uh, the interesting thing that I noted there is that even if we had a, a static, statically provisioned IP on the cache server, if there was also an autoconf address, which you can have any number of, of addresses on the interface, um, I found cases where the server was preferring to use the, the autoconf address as its source address. So that was affecting things like logging and uh, you know connections from the server weren't showing up from the expected IP address, which uh, which was was a little surprising. Um, so I uh, you know in our config management we have since gone in and updated the societal settings to disable set both of these to zero. Uh, and, and disable autoconf going forward, but that's after it's in production and, and, and or, you know, once it's made production ready. So these are typically disabled for network hardening anyway. Uh, so if you do disable these as part of your, your, you know, your standard practices in your, in your environment, for the provisioning part, you know, when you're deploying new hardware, there's a, a period of time where you want to make sure that those are enabled. Like I said, they are by default. If you turn them off, just, just be aware of that. Uh, there's also, in, in Cecil and Extensions they can be enabled uh, as another societal uh, parameter. It's probably not recommended though <coughs> for a CDN environment or not necessary. So infrastructure considerations uh, again this this may vary depending on the needs of your environment. Uh, you know we at Comcast we use a uh, a derivative of the CentOS network install uh, image. So it's a very lightweight image and all the OS packages get loaded off of uh, a, a, a local YUM uh, repo mirror. Uh, so we need to make sure that during the kickstart process, which is gonna be purely IPv6 at this point, there's gonna be no IPv4 on, on the box. Uh, the Yum servers had to be fronted with, with IPv6, had to be reachable. Um, config management, we, we use Ansible full playbooks uh, these days on our, uh, on our systems. If you're using Puppet or something like that, and that needs to be reachable <coughs> during the post-install phase of your kickstart, that needs IPv6. Um, the new one here was the Traffic Ops API. We were, we were running traffic ops just as IPv4 only for, for the longest time because we just didn't have a need for, for V6. 
2006 at that level, uh, this, this changed. So there's a, uh, a little new package that I'm going to be talking about at the moment that gets installed as part of our post install. The newly installed system at this point is very generic. It's it's it doesn't have an identity. Um, you know, it's just it's just cookie cutter. So we're we're basically going to be relying on uh, the TODB as almost a CMDB. Uh, you know, the, the expectation is that all the newly you know the newly deployed gear is going to be pre-entered into TODB. It's going to have all its network information in there, host name, all that stuff. So the, this virgin box just needs to know how to talk to TO and give the information that it, that it needs to fully configure itself. So new tool, uh, TC Net config. Uh, it's available here, uh, github.com, in the contest or TC Net config. Uh, it's written in Go. This is the, the handy little blue package that, that ties it all together. And that's the host auto configure. Uh, it's permanent settings based on what it finds in, in traffic ops. Um, in that repo, and I can probably show you that in a, in a moment, there's uh, some examples, uh, wrapper scripts, and like a systemd unit file if you want to package this up as an RPM or if you want to just use config management to you know, manually install the, uh, uh, or directly install the system D unit and, and things like that to get it activated as a service, and you can do that. There's examples there. Um, there's also a config file that goes along with this, That's, and there's an example in the repo um, that needs to be installed, so again, um, it's handy if you have some sort of automated config management that runs during your post install that, that will lay down the, the config file and put in the appropriate credentials uh, to talk to TO API. Um, like I said, basically CMDB. So yeah, it's um, it, it takes a uh, a server with no identity and it pulls that identity back from from traffic ops. And, uh, and from there, uh, depending on your, how you do your config management, the, the server may be able to identify itself as an edge cache, a mid cache, a traffic router. Um, yeah, this, this is where the server starts to differentiate itself and, and run its, its, its specific playbooks that it needs. How does it do that, actually? I mean, how, what information is coming back from the auto-configured box that it can look up this up in the database? Is that the next slide? Yes, I think so. OK. Fantastic question. So so how it's set up right now, um, as I mentioned, the, the, the prefix, the slash 64 prefix that we put on our caches is almost unique. Uh, so that, that's a that's an easy identifier, <coughs> but that's different than predictable. <sighs> so the prefix is going to be known by traffic ops, and so if you if you're configuring IPv6 information in traffic ops before the box physically gets deployed, it's going to have the prefix information in there. The router the slash, slash slash 64 is configured on the server object. And so what he's saying is the autocom address is fits within that so well, And you can do that then. Yeah, so it so it it basically what what TC Net config does is it hits TO API and pulls back the entire list of servers and it parses through those for the IPv6 prefixes that are derived from all the all all the IPv6 addresses that are already in the database. So it takes the, that list of prefixes, 
and then it takes a look at the prefix that it's determined from its own autoconf interface. And even though the addresses, the, the individual, you know, the specific addresses don't match, the prefix must. So you can predict what prefix is going to come up. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that right. your your prefix is all is going to be the correct. It's not going to be a random prefix. It's going to be the prefix for that network connection, uh, which is predetermined. So, so you're assuming you're connected to a dedicated router interface and not a switch, right? Right. Okay. So there are there are exceptions. Uh, some some of our hosts, uh, particularly traffic routers today, tend to share prefixes. Uh, so there is an, an alternate mechanism that I that I've built into it, and you know it, it could be modified further to, uh, um, you know, I guess a, a good way to do this would have been if traffic ops had a field for server serial number, right? Because then, uh, doesn't it? No. Well, yeah, it's not it's API accessible. Uh, <laughs> but there is. You're randomly assigning the server configuration from a pool? Um, no. So it's it's not random. The, ser the, server, it, the server details are configured into traffic ops. So they're known by traffic ops. Are you, so you're putting in like the MAC address then of each individual server? Or? Uh, no, just. Just the uh, just the IP well the IP addresses v4 yeah. and v6 and we're using the v6 right, one. Right, you're only discovering it by the prefix. Right. So the prefix is so going to be unique. Who the server is. Yeah. So okay, I think I see where you're going. The, so the problem when you when you have multiple servers sharing a prefix, um, you know you you can't uniquely identify the box that way just just by looking at the IPs and in traffic ops. So there's a there's a fallback mechanism built into uh, the net config tool that relies on IPMI tool. So if you if your server has an ILO or BMC whatever out of band LAN address configured on it, it will use IPMI tool if present to fetch that address from the BMC, and then it compares that to the ILO address that's stored in traffic ops, which at that point should be, that's, that's analogous to your serial number. Like that has to be unique per box. Um, I don't use that as the primary mechanism just because it relies on, on additional tools. Like IPMI tool may not be there. There's, you know, there's just additional dependencies, so it's, it's not as clean. Um, ideally, every box would have a slash 64 on it and, and everything would just work automatically. So there is the alternate mechanism there if boxes are sharing a prefix. Um, and like I said, that could be modified if we wanted to say, use a serial number. You know, you can pull the serial number back from IPMI tool. Um, but I mean, if you're putting your ILO interfaces in, in there, it's, it's essentially the same thing. Uh, so if this, process fails, uh, if it can't reach TO or something like that, there's a there's a network config problem where IPv6 isn't working, something along those lines, the box will perpetually stay in its in its autocomp state. So next time it reboots, it'll try to to fix itself all over again. And if it fails, it just it just stays. The nice thing about this is it opens up the possibility of in your in your warehouse you could start cloning disks. Like at this point, they're all the same, uh, so you could potentially clone disks. They're not going to be able to configure themselves because they're not in their correct location with the right prefix assigned on their local gateway. So they'll go through their Kickstart post install. They'll shut down. You ship them to their, their or your clone to disk for that matter. Uh, you ship them to their final destination, cross country, whatever. They get plugged into their proper network, which has the correct prefix configured on the gateway. It boots up, and uh, TC Net config does its thing and rebuilds its local inter uh, interface config uh, with the static address. Uh, so you can really pre-provision these things in advance, and they don't have to work where they're being built. They just have to work, you know, the, the 
the network information has to be correct in the destination as the match was in TL. So an example of the output here, um, this shows the you know, TC net config being used via system D using the wrapper script, which is in, in that, uh, there's an example of that in the repo. The wrapper script, all the wrapper does when the service starts is it looks at the local interfaces and uh, and determines if they're just dynamic, you know, using autocomp, or if they have static <coughs> interfaces on them. If they have static interfaces, it assumes it's properly configured, and it and it uh, it's actually that's the second case here. It basically no ops and and just the system continues to boot. It doesn't do anything. If it does detect an autocomp address on the interface, then it calls the, the net config binary, uh, which then reaches out to TO and does the, the reconfiguration. And it will even update, you know, it'll update the host name. You can see the host name changes uh, as it's running. Uh, so it, it, it you know, correctly identifies the box at that point. Um, so at this point, the you know the overall process, I guess step zero for us is is to build the ISO. Um, step one would be to boot the ISO and and, and kick off the kickstart. Uh, step two is the post install. So we, as I mentioned, we use Ansible full playbooks. We have a, a kickstart specific playbook that runs during the post install phase of the kickstart. And that installs the TC net config tool. It installs the, the configuration file for TC net config and various other unrelated things that we like to do in our post install. And then the box shuts down in step three. Uh, and then step four is first boot, where it comes up and, and does this. Uh, We'll show you here in a moment the config file for the net config. Um, there's some interesting details in there. Um, if anyone wants to play with this later on, has questions, I can be found via either of those channels. I haven't been terribly active on the, the traffic control. So the TC net config repo, uh, again, it's github.com and under the Comcast org. Uh, my hope is that if this is something that people find useful, uh, I may PR this into the into the traffic control repo as a, as a utility. So the config file, uh, uh, there's some information here about setting it up. Uh, the config file, Fairly straightforward. Uh, so it's going to be the, the URL to your traffic uh, traffic ops API server, uh, the user uh, and password used to authenticate. Uh, again, um, when TC net config runs, it needs to uh, uh, install the the name servers as well. So names name servers aren't an attribute that's stored in DODB for a server, so you have to specify it somewhere. So this gets installed into the network. Um, and then this networks, this is probably the more most interesting part here. So a box may have multiple network interfaces. It may be ETH0, ETH1. Um, there's link local addresses automatically that just have to be there on all your IPv6 interfaces. Um, what that networks attribute does, and that's a list, you can, you, you know, you can, uh, 
comma separate, you can add a, a bunch of prefixes in there. TC net config will take that, that prefix or list of prefixes and use it to filter out your, your local interfaces. So you may have, um, you know, ETH0 may be your pr production interface with an auto comp uh, prefix that is contained within that prefix. ETH1 may be an out of band uh, management only interface using some other prefix entirely. Uh, you know, this, that, that networks list there is just used to help TC Network identify which specific interface, physical interface, it should be caring about, and it ignores all the rest that don't match. Um, anything else of interest in there? Uh, yeah, in the miscellaneous folder, there is the net config service unit file for system D and the wrapper script that goes along with it. Uh, like I said, the wrapper just checks to see if, if, the, if the box is properly configured already or not. If it is, it just doesn't do anything. It needs configuration that calls the net config binary. Uh, and And that's uh, that's it in a nutshell. The, you know, just leveraging the magic that's built into IPv6 to do things that we previously had to use separate systems for, uh, and centralized, stateful, you know, DHCP servers and things like that. You don't have to worry about a, a new world. Uh, any other questions or? Possibly. Yes. Uh, this might be more of a question. Sure. What if you have? Uh, what if you have, like? So we do use Buffer Bay, uh, and it works. Okay. So. <laughs> so we so we do some in our in our pick start. We have some sort of um, secret sauce. Uh, we I think Jeff's been trying to get it merged upstream okay. with CentOS to, to sort of automate our bonding config. Okay. Uh, because CentOS doesn't like to do that during the start phase automatically. Yeah, that was kind of my question. Especially if you're doing lack key, like lack key, like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we've got some special stuff that we do in our, in our, in, in the, um, uh, in the, the install image to, to get that working. Okay. Uh, but this doesn't, ma like, it doesn't matter for, for this. Like for, it, for, for this, yeah, it, 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 again, it was more of a kickstart of like, because if it comes up, it needs to go out to something. Mm. So it's if it, if the LACP doesn't line up, it's not there. Right, yeah, and that's and that's a separate it's a separate issue from right. this, but it's not a trivial one. And the last question: um, the config file. This is assuming that every server that comes up is going to go out to the same DNS. Yes. Okay. Which in our environment, it's pretty easy because you know we have AnyCast DNS servers. Um, right. Which if you don't have that, if you if your different regions have different DNS servers, then that's something you'll have to manage or you config could management or something like that. Theoretically spam it. Just throw everything in the list and the ones that don't work won't work. Or here's the east one, here's the east ISO, yeah. here's the west ISO. So, so you, you can only have um, in your like Etsy name D.com or whatever, I think you can only have three name servers maximum. Uh, anything beyond that just gets ignored, if I remember correctly. Um, well, you can have a DNS yeah. server for just for this, and then once they're configured, they can just get those to do it. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one way to, to get around that. Yeah. We'll say having any cast DNS is, is <laughs> real yeah. handy. <laughs>
15 minutes until the next mark, so. <laughs> <laughs> I still have time.